morning. Hi, everyone. Happy summer. My name is Kelly Shushak, and I am the pastor here at Edges. I'm grateful always to be able to say that. I hope you feel welcome in our worship today. I see that many of you are here for the first time. I want you to know up front that I love this church. I love it because there are great people, and I love it even more because I get to watch God do real stuff in people's lives, and I think that's the number one thing that helps anyone believe, is when you see God doing things that you know people couldn't do on their own, it strengthens your own faith, and I think that's what church is about. <clears throat> it's good if you're starting with us new today because it's close to the beginning of a new series that we're in. It's called What Else is Good? We've been in a year of thinking about how in the world it is that you can hold on to what's good when things, frankly, seem pretty fragile these days. So today, um, I'm going to argue that we can hold on to good in the world when it seems shaky. And I'm going to argue that worship is one thing that helps us to do that. That worship is one orienting factor. So I'd like for you to just start by thinking, what are your thoughts about wor what worship is? I'm going to ask us today to consider a concept that I'm going to call everyday worship. Everyday worship. I want to focus on the everyday part for just a moment. By that, I mean everyday two words, every day as two words, meaning seven days a week. How do you worship every single day of the week, not just on Sundays? But more importantly, I want us to focus on everyday as in one word, like common or ordinary. So common, ordinary worship all the time, seven days a week, the opposite of special occasion worship. If you and I are going to consider anything in an everyday kind of way, I think we better know for sure what we're signing on for and why. Why in the world you'd want to do that. So I'd like to start by asking you what you think really is worship. That's the question. Is worship a service that you go to at a church? Is worship a strong feeling that you have towards something like I worship potatoes? <laughs> Does anyone really worship potatoes? This is one of those things I say off the cuff, and later people will say, why did you choose potatoes? You should have chosen tulips or something. Anyway, the point is, is worship a feeling? Is it a church service that you go to once a week? What is worship? That's our first question for this morning. And those of you who've been here before know that we often talk out loud to each other in groups. We do so simply because we want to give God every opportunity to get into the room. And that doesn't just happen through me or through our musicians. It happens because we're all gathered to do the work that is worship. So to that end, it's always okay when we get into groups. If you want to just listen, that's a form of worship too. And it's okay if you want to speak as well. So like I said, we're here to answer the question, what is worship today? I want to even the playing field first in case some of you are about to look it up on your iPhones. It's not an option. So here's what your iPhone would say. Your iPhone would say worship the noun is the feeling of reverence and adoration of a deity. The verb form would be to show reverence for a deity. I hope we can come up with something better than that. If that's what worship is, then every day seems like about six days too much to me. I'm hoping worship has a few more teeth in it than a warm feeling toward a god or a goddess. Not because that would be a bad thing, but because it just doesn't seem like it would do much for you. So, what do you think? What is worship? Why don't you find yourself a group of five or six folks? Try to have at least one person you don't know in your group. Introduce yourselves and take about three minutes to tackle that question.
All right, about 20 seconds left. Tell that was kind of a natural breaking point. All right. Let's call it back in. The question was easy today, only three words. What is worship? So what did you think? What were the personal definitions of worship that you heard? What did you hear in your group that you think rings true? What's worship? What are some phrases we could begin with? What we what would help me out? Sorry, Hope. What would God usually be with? Worship with God, the Holy no, Spirit. Work. Work. With. Work. And God usually be with. Work with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Excellent. Hope says worship is working with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, thanks, Hope. What else? Okay. Okay, Lou says it happens every day because being with God helps you then to go out and live your faith. It's not talking about it necessarily. It's being able to live it as a result of having been with God in an everyday kind of life. Yes, Lou? Yes. Is that right, Lou? Yes. yes. Okay, that was the whole sermon. It's been nice. <laughs> it's been nice being with you all today. Yeah, okay. Worship would, uh, will affect our living because we've been with God, because of being with God. Okay, what else did you hear? Oh, worship can be passion or excitement about something. I like the way that Tombo said that because worship doesn't have to be worship of God. It can be worship of anything. Um, when it is worship of God, it would be passion and excitement about God, or it could be passion and excitement about potatoes, for example. All right, so Joey said that Mark said that it's being appreciative of everything that you see because God made it, because God did it. It's learning to give God credit for everyday things. Oh. For better or for worse, worship is whatever you assign the highest value in your life. Ooh. Oh. Okay, what else? Okay, worship can be peace or stillness. So worship can be found in peace or stillness, or it can even be peace and stillness. Both sure, both and. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Viv. Viv summarizes this side of the room by saying, <laughs> in summary, Viv says this side of the room thinks worship is living consciously or with attention. Intention. Did you say intention? Intention. Good. Okay. A couple others. No pressure this side of the room, but. Okay, so I think to summarize what Cassie's saying, she says she thinks of bridging to God in any moment as being worship and that that bridge can come out of fear or worry or any, anything, really, the bridge can come out of, and she's thinking about how often she doesn't take that bridge. 
One more? Sure. A form of worship can be finding community with other people who are seeking to know God together, and that can be a form of our worship together, which is why many of us migrate in sort of a, a, a weekly habitual pattern um, to seek that form of worship. Yeah, excellent. So, um, wow, by your definitions, if your definitions are true, how many of us have been lucky enough, even in this past week, to really experience worship if worship is an encounter with God, if worship is being with God, if worship is knowing something from God, that's really different than going to church once a week, isn't it? That would surely change everything. Don't raise your hands, but I'd like for you to ask yourselves if you've had an encounter with God once or twice, much less every day. And if so, or if not, what do you think the factors are as we begin thinking about this topic together? So when we say welcome to worship every week when we come into this room, whoever welcomes you says that every week. I try to say it in some form every week. When we say it at the doors or when we say it at the name tag table or when we say it in gathering grounds, welcome. Do we really mean welcome to the gathering that we're having with God today? Do we really have that expectation when we come in the room? Because I'm not sure I'm always ready for that. I don't know about you, but it makes me feel a lot more comfortable and a lot less over the top to think about worship as a service I attend. Something I do in the construct of an hour or so. You know, some songs we sing or some ideas we consider or even some feelings we may have or may get generated because we've been here. But what happens if I actually believe and expect that worship, that any worship, including when I walk into this room on Sundays, is an opportunity to encounter God? The Bible claims that God is everywhere, and the Bible claims that God created us for worship. So that must mean, again, if A plus B, then what is C? C must mean that worship, that God and meeting God can happen anywhere. So why doesn't it always feel like it? Why isn't that always the case, as Cassidy said about the bridges? Maybe it's about who sets up the meeting. Is it God that sets up the meeting? And if so, how do I know when and where the appointment is? And will that meeting do anything for me? Is it worth my investment? If it's up to me to schedule the encounter. How do I make sure God gets the invitation to come? And what happens if it feels like God doesn't show up? What if nothing happens at all? I wonder if that's why Miriam and Webster reduce the definition to just a feeling. I wonder if that's why even devout Christian people have reduced worship to mean going to church. That kind of reductionism makes it super easy to wonder if God is real at all. The risks really are through the roof of what we're talking about when we talk about worship is having a real encounter with God because surely that would change everything. So I wondered if maybe it would help if we look at an example, there are many of them, for how encounters with God happen. There are many recorded in the Bible. Today I've picked one of my favorites, a story about an encounter that a guy named Moses had with God. I want to give you a little bit of true backstory about Moses before we turn to this passage this morning. When we meet Moses today, he's going to seem like us, like a normal human. But the truth is that Moses, like many of us, had a pretty messy childhood. His childhood involved a lot of really hard stuff. He was abandoned as a baby, for example. And it involved a lot of really lucky stuff. He was adopted into a really prominent family. And it involved a lot of confusing stuff. 
because Moses was part of a totally oppressed people group. Moses' middle years were full of lots of finding himself. His finding himself began to happen only after several really big screw-ups, many of which are recorded in the Bible. But by some miracle, these didn't cause a totally irreparable train wreck. If you don't find any hope in anything else today, just know that there are examples of people who've been through lots of stuff without becoming totally irreparable train wrecks because God came and helped. But the darkness of Moses' middle years did leave Moses with a truckload of guilt, a permanent layer of shame, and a closet full of secrets, just like many of us. So it's at that point in Moses' life that our story picks up. But believe it or not, Moses seems to have pulled himself together, and he's become rather ordinary. He even met a girl at a roadside well. I think that was like a first century chat room. <laughs> While he's there at the well, he defends this girl against a group of people who come to harm her. This girl is flattered and she's smitten, so she goes home to tell her dad about Moses, and Moses ends up marrying her. He joins the family business in the sheep shop, and life returns to normal. And then out of the blue, this meeting happens. The record of the meeting is found in Exodus chapter 3. And remember the commitment we made last week. Someone will look it up and call out the page number. So could somebody help us out? Exodus chapter 3. Page 31. <laughs> wow. First verse. First verse. Is it still page 31? Gosh, I'm going to have to start giving out candy for who gets it first. <laughs> okay, page 31, Exodus chapter 3, where the story of Moses continues, and here's what happens. Moses was taking care of the flock for his father-in-law, as I mentioned, and his father-in-law was Midian's priest. He led his flock out to the edge of the desert, and he came to God's mountain called Horeb. The Lord's messenger appeared to him in a flame of fire in the middle of a bush. Now Moses saw that the bush was in flames and it didn't burn up. Then Moses said to himself, hmm, let me check out this amazing sight and find out why that bush ain't burning up. You know, I mean, he's just... When the Lord saw that Moses was coming to look, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And so Moses said, I'm here. Then the Lord said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. So that seems pretty simple, right? If worship is an encounter with God, I'd say Moses just experienced worship, right? What's there to learn from this simple story? I'd like for us to wonder whether Moses' story here is a template for how we also could experience worship. If so, then what if these things are true? Number one, God invites. What if God always invites what if there has never been a time where God isn't inviting, where God isn't calling Kelly, Kelly, Jacob, Jacob, Luke, Frank, Jenny, Bentley? What if there is never a time when God isn't inviting? If God is everywhere and God created us for worship and God wants for us to worship him, what if God is always calling out of every bush, every candle, every boardroom, every worry? What if God is always inviting and what if we lived like that was so? Number two, God invites through ordinary things. What if we didn't have to cobble together some big emotionally driven thing? What if God is always inviting in every ordinary moment? Number three, 
God, at least in this case, and in many others in the Bible and in our own experiences, God invites imperfect people who have lots of baggage. What if you don't have to get cleaned up before you can participate? What if God is always inviting in the middle of every moment, even if you're not ready? And number four, what if we have to respond to God's invitation for it to be worship? What if Moses had just kept walking? If we won't ever stop doing what we're always doing long enough for something different to happen, what if we may miss the real invitations God is issuing? This next month in August, we, the Shushock family, will begin our 10th year in Blacksburg. We moved here from Texas where it's so hot and so flat this time of year that most every living thing is either dried or it's fried. <laughs> now that Texas climate was also a really good metaphor for my life when our moving truck pulled up into our new Blacksburg driveway. Pretty dried and pretty fried. But as a new local family, I think we looked like we had it all together. I think we would have passed for normal back then. My husband Frank had been hired for this big old job at Virginia Tech, and we had three beautiful, smart, easy enough kids. So we bought a nice house with good neighbors and walking distance from almost every Blacksburg commodity. We looked in control and life seemed fine. except I was having real trouble with worship. By that, I mean I was in crisis because I didn't think I could find God anywhere. I think there were probably a long string of circumstances like is true for almost anyone who loses their way. I think there were many reasons that my world had started spinning, including the fact that we had been living at mock speed for several years, not just days or weeks or months, several years without any break. I think I was trying to cope with some real hurt in ways that were justifiable, but also really dangerous for me. I don't know if you've ever done that. I got myself into a position where in order to keep everything I'd put in motion moving in the right direction, I had to maintain a position of absolute control which meant that I couldn't afford to need God, right? <laughs> I was in control. And this was good because I was having trouble locating God anyway. I probably don't have to tell you what this does to your credibility if you admit that you've lost God and you're a pastor. <laughs> Especially if you're in a new town where you might want a job as one who helps make space for God and people to find each other. This is problematic. So if I had to summarize it now, I would tell you that speed and resentment and control were three of the things that had gotten in the way of my worship. Those are the kind of things that will take all of your attention if you let them. <clears throat> so I resolved that we would find a church where it looked like other people were encountering God, and I would just hope some of it would eventually rub off on me. I was also pretty sure at that moment that I would never be a pastor ever again because I knew I couldn't stand the sham of pretending any longer. I wanted out. I wanted to work at the library or at the Chamber of Commerce. And I wanted to see if I could forget what the Bible says that I was created to relate with, to meet, and to encounter God. And then one day... A neighbor came to welcome us with two little baskets of fruit, one blueberry basket and one blackberry basket. She said they came from a place where you pick berries yourself called Windrush Farm. 
to this day, all I can tell you is that I felt that as a peculiar moment. Maybe it was just because I was fresh off the Texas truck where the only live thing you can pick is in late August are scorpions out of the toes of your shoes. <laughs> but I knew I had to go and experience what she was talking about. To see if I could find a place where the wind would rush again. Like Moses, I just cocked my head and my attention, and inside myself, I felt, I need to go and see this amazing sight. Long and truly miraculous story short, I kept going back to Windrush Farm that first season in Blacksburg. Before I knew it, the entire island in my kitchen was covered in fresh berries. Our kids would have berry contests, you know, throwing them up and catching them in their mouths, seeing how many claps they could get in before it fell to the floor. <clears throat> I put berries in baked oatmeal. I put berries in salmon sauce. I even put berries in the neighbor's mailboxes. Soon I found that the little ritual of driving down that country road and standing inside the skin of those trees near their backbones, really. Shaking them gently and waiting to hear the plank in my bucket. I said plank. I meant plank or plunk. I just wanted to correct that before we went on. <laughs> what are those words called that sound like what they say? Onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia. That's what I was after, but I said the wrong word. Okay, anyway, plank. That's what they would do, plank in my bucket. Those blueberries became the burning bushes where I recognized God calling me, inviting me to gather with and to trust something other than myself again, to rely on something other than my cracking shell to hold me together. And because I stopped and took notice almost accidentally, almost in complete desperation, because I stopped and took notice, I showed up where God already was. And I rediscovered worship. Now, I believe God was inviting me to this all along. I believe God was making space and time and love just for me. I believe God is doing that for every human God has ever created. I believe God was desperate to confirm again in my life that encounters are real and they are possible and that they change everything about how I am anchored in the world. Barbara Lund Bland is a theologian who I respect, and she says that this is the hardest thing to believe about the whole Moses story, his stopping. She says his halting is even more odd than the bush burning in the background, that that's the rarer thing. She says people like Moses and like us have an almost endless capacity to keep on walking. I mentioned that speed and bitterness and control propelled me to keep on walking. What are your reasons? What makes you miss worship? There are lots of other things. Rationality is one thing that can keep us from turning aside. We don't believe in visions. Especially if they might mess with our ability to be in control. Something that comes not from you. That's one thing. Maybe it's a self-important or inflated ego. Maybe you don't want to ever need anything. Maybe it's a fear that something might change, that you might have to take a risk. Maybe it's a preoccupation with any number of technological advances that just keep you dull. Well, there are plenty of sound reasons to keep on walking. I just would like to ask us, are they worth what we're missing? 
Will they help us to hold on to what is good? Will fear or resentment or ego or technology or rationality, will they help us hold on to what is good? Or might they guarantee that we will miss the good that is calling out to us? I can't tell you what will happen if you do stop. I wouldn't even pretend to know what the God of the universe will do or say or communicate when you have each other's unbridled attention. You and God. Us and God on a Sunday. I can tell you that what happened for Moses is what's been happening to me. Moses took off his shoes and he experienced that there was a holy floor underneath his life and that foundation gave him the courage to sign on for stuff he never would have done. It gave him the courage to sign on and lead the entire rescue of a whole people group. What's more important, Moses got to worship again and again and again. And you know what happened when that happened to him? He got swept up into God's dreams. And they were audacious and holy and good and huge. And they were dreams he never would have had on his own. Because he stopped. Because God did the first three parts and he did the fourth. He responded. In my own life, encountering God in those blueberry bushes, just showing up over and over and over again down that country road, it recreated a pattern for me, an open space, if you will, where I learned to show up and to trust that God would be there too. A habit. And in time, not immediately, but in time, some healing happened, some healing from those self-destructive behaviors I told you about. And I found my way back to some of God's dreams for my family and for myself. And most importantly, I truly knew that I was no longer alone. And I didn't just believe there was a floor under my life because I read about Moses in the Bible or anyone else in the Bible. I knew it because it was true in my own life. There was a floor I know in my bones the same story as the people in the Bible who met God. And I know that my only part in making that story happen is showing up and turning all my attention towards something ordinary and peculiar but full of God. It's true. God can come through any ordinary old thing. A tumbleweed on a sheep prairie, a blueberry bush on a country road, If we went around the room and asked where all you have met God, you'd share about hospital rooms or poignant conversations. You'd share about ordinary mishaps. You'd share about the places where God has met you for unexpected, holy encounters. And if you don't have any of those, and especially if you don't have any of them lately, can I recommend that you decide to show up someplace every Sunday? If it's not this one, let it be anyone, just once a week, so you simply can make yourself available for an encounter with God. Start there. And then maybe you're picking blueberries. Could be going for a ritual walk on a daily basis. Maybe it could be doing something like we just created this um, Edges Spotify. I'm supposed to be able to say this in the right way. I think there's something that's going to come up on the screen that will help you get there. Is it? All right. So there, that's what you could do. That is a Spotify playlist because a lot of our music is on Spotify. So we created a playlist. So if you want to do that, then try that as a way to create some space to have some connection. And don't give up on it when it's not a habit yet. Keep on doing something. Maybe your daily thing would be that you're going to stop to write down three things that seem to matter most at the end of your day in a journal of sorts. 
What I can tell you is that I almost didn't go to the Windrush Farm. I felt it as a peculiar moment, and then I almost dismissed it. What if 10 years later I was in the same place? Don't dismiss the space that you may carve out or create. It doesn't really matter what you do. It just matters that you and I do our part, which is to show up in some places where the wind can rush in, where God's Spirit can meet us. I'll tell you this much. If you happen to be in the room today and you do not want your past to be your future, but you cannot figure out how to change it. I believe worship is the peculiar answer. It's what we were created for. That's how I can say it with confidence. It's the one thing we know for sure God always wants for all of us that God will use to transform us. And for those of us who found this to be true in recent days or weeks or months, the way to keep on living into eternity right now is just to keep on worshiping, to keep on showing up and seeing what God will do next. Worship is one way we can do our part. It's one way we can show up. It's one way we can step aside and stop. It's a practical way we can hold on to what is good. Who doesn't need that?